this video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that lets you build a beautiful website regardless of how strictly you conform to 1980s gender roles. That's another joke that'll make sense later. Hello and welcome back to Wolf Girl Summer. If you haven't seen my last video, to recap, I'm making a series of videos on the beast that is the Teen Wolf franchise. As much as I'd appreciate you watching part one, you honestly don't really need to have seen part one to watch this video. This is a bit of a standalone intermission in between my discussion of the MTV Teen Wolf television adaptation. In part one, I talked about the first three seasons of the MTV show, and in the next part, I'll be talking about the last three seasons of the show, but right now in part to we are going to take a break from MTV Teen Wolf and instead travel back in time to this franchise's beginnings. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if a fair amount of people who have watched MTV Teen Wolf, maybe even a fair amount of hardcore fans of the show, were completely unaware of the fact that it is an adaptation. I could be wrong, but I get the sense that the modern TV show has pretty much eclipsed the source material in popularity, no pun intended. So I'm actually really excited to share these movies with you. I'm sure plenty of you have already seen them or are aware of them, but they're definitely a little more obscure nowadays. And I also have to say that there is a pretty big surprise element in this video. There is a bit of a twist in the story today, so you should keep watching it. Just trust me. And if you're wondering why I'm in a different location than the last video, no I'm not. I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. Did you know that the success of Dylan O'Brien as an actor can be traced directly to the release of the Nicolas Cage film Valley Girl? Allow me to explain. The year is 1983. The main character? Atlantic Releasing Corporation. By this time, Atlantic had only been around for a few years, mostly releasing international art house films, low-budget independent films, and some softcore porn for good measure. But when they released their teen comedy Valley Girl, it was an unprecedented success. The film, which had cost only $350,000 to make, made over $17 million at the box office. Julie's cool. Randy's hot. She's from the valley. He's not. Their next big hit came with Night of the Comet, also a low-budget teen-oriented film, and one of my favorite movies. You should watch it. See, this is the problem with these things. Daddy would have gotten us Uzis. These two successes, but especially that of Valley Girl, not only attracted bigger studio Paramount Pictures, who agreed to finance some Atlantic films in exchange for the home media and television rights, but also prompted the folks at Atlantic to ask themselves, how can we make the cheapest possible movie in the shortest possible amount of time? And the answer was Teen Wolf. Actor Michael J. Fox happened to have a bit of a break in filming for the sitcom Family Ties, his main gig at the time. This was very shortly before he was cast in Back to the Future, and the rest is history. You guys suck. No, really? Teen Wolf, the original film, our initial source material, tells the story of Scott Howard, an aggressively average teenage basketball player living in Beacon Town, who yearns to be something more than ordinary. I'm sick of it, Boof. I'm sick of being so average. But he gets more than he bargained for one night when he suddenly transforms into a werewolf during the full moon. See, on the back of the DVD, the tagline says, he always wanted to be special, but he never expected this. And yeah, I guess that about sums it up. Our peripheral characters include Scott's best friend, Styles, no last name for now. It's got him looking good out there, babe. Yeah, how would you know, Styles? Scott's love interest, Boof. Boof, how the hell are you? Say no. No. Great talking to you. That's... Her name is Boof. Scott's dad, Harold Howard, who runs the local hardware store and is also a werewolf. The werewolfism is hereditary in this version. Scott inherits his powers instead of being bitten by another werewolf. We also have hot popular girl Pamela and her intimidating boyfriend Mick. There's also Scott's mean principal, who feels like he should be played by Leslie Nielsen, but maybe I'm just thinking of Leslie Nielsen's character in Prom Night. There's Scott and Stiles' other friend, Chubby, who exists in the film exclusively to be the target of fat jokes. And finally, Coach Bobby Finstock. That's right, the only specific characters that made it into the MTV adaptation are Scott, 
Styles, and Coach Finstock. So, all in all, Teen Wolf 1985 is an okay movie. <laughs> it's alright. It has some comedic moments that really work. Finstock is actually really funny in this, just like the eventual show. He's got some great lines. There's three rules that I live by. Never get less than 12 hours sleep. Never play cards with a guy who's got the same first name as a city. And never go near a lady who's got a tattoo of a dagger on her body. Now you stick with that. Everything else is cream cheese. The whole sequence of Scott transforming for the first time, culminating in him realizing his dad is also a werewolf, is pretty great in the way they play it. Jeez Louise. Jeez Louise is an objectively hilarious thing to say after transforming into a werewolf for the first time. And in addition to all the written jokes and dialogue, there's so much comedy that comes from the inherent absurdity and camp of the situation. An explanation is probably long overdue. One of the biggest differences between this movie and the MTV show is the fact that Scott Howard, a little while after transforming for the first time, actually goes public with his werewolfism. He accidentally transforms during a basketball game in front of everyone, and for the latter half of the movie, everybody just knows he's a werewolf. He is openly a werewolf. And I think that that is actually perhaps this film's greatest strength. See, unlike virtually all other werewolf media, once Scott's secret is out, Everyone thinks he's awesome. They're like, hell yeah, we like the werewolf version of you way better. <laughs> Which is bold, right? <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen another supernatural story that does that. This obviously contributes to a lot of the most memorable comedy in the movie. The idea that this 1940s looking werewolf man would just be strutting around school in a letterman jacket, winning basketball games, stealing your girlfriend is crazy. It's so funny. I think the problems with the movie come more in some of the writing, the themes, the construction of the story. I want to clarify something. A few people on my last video seemed to think that I was taking the material too seriously, like that I shouldn't criticize a silly teen show for its themes or its execution or whatever. And first of all, I didn't even think I was being that harsh on Teen Wolf. I honestly saw it as just me telling you about all the funny, campy stuff on the show. I didn't really think it was a bad show overall. My only serious criticisms were about ethical things, like the occasional mishandling of really serious subject matter and stuff like that. I didn't think I was, like, tearing the show apart. But even if I had, I think it's really silly to act like we can't think deeply about unserious media. Like, most stories need themes to be good. That doesn't mean they have to be life-changing or even socially relevant or anything, but they should probably make some internal sense when it comes to what they're trying to say. So with that in mind, let's talk about theme in Michael J. Fox Teen Wolf. So, ostensibly, this is a coming-of-age story about being yourself, why it's good to be true to yourself. I want to play, but I gotta be myself. Though Scott initially basks in the newfound attention and fame that being a Chad werewolf brings him, he must eventually succeed on his own terms as just plain old ordinary Scott. But, uh, the movie kind of does a really bad job of illustrating this. The main people who urge Scott to be himself throughout the movie are his love interest, Boof, and his dad, his werewolf dad. Boof is basically the friend who has always loved and appreciated Scott for who he is, even when nobody else did. You, Scott Howard. Not the wolf. So her justification for wanting Scott to be true to himself and not be a werewolf most of the time is just that she liked him before he was a werewolf. Scott's dad's justification is a little more interesting. Late in the film, Mr. Howard explains that when he was a youngster like Scott, the man who is now Scott's principal was pursuing Scott's mom, who is now dead. We never find out what happened to her. But for some reason, Rusty Thorne set his cap for her too. And no matter what we tried, he just wouldn't go away. But Scott's dad used his werewolf powers to intimidate the principal to get him to stop his unwanted advances towards Scott's mom. Was he scared? Scared? He lost control of his bodily functions. And he doesn't imply that he actually did anything to the guy other than just scare him, but he says that this behavior, using his werewolf powers to threaten someone, scared him. 
And that's why he doesn't support Scott taking social advantage of his werewolf powers. He gives him kind of a verbatim Uncle Ben speech. When you want it, you're going to have great power. And with great power goes a greater responsibility. And I don't know, I just feel like this is kind of weak. First of all, what is Scott actually doing with his powers? He is using them to be better at basketball, and for some reason they make him more popular with everyone. But for all this implied talk of consequences of using his powers in this way, we never really see any of those consequences. We never even see the werewolfism manifest in any sort of uncontrollable aggression or violence until very late in the film, and it's weak then, too. Late in the film, at a school dance, Pamela's bully boyfriend Mick starts a fight with Scott, and Scott kind of scratches him in retaliation. But to be clear, he doesn't hurt Mick at all. He literally just rips his shirt. But everyone is shocked by Scott's aggression, even though Mick instigated this. I think what the movie really needed to get this point across was some blood. How do you make a werewolf movie, even a funny one, with no gore, no violence? If it was clear from the beginning that Scott's wolf form was more aggressive, more cruel, more negative in any way than his human form, or if he had really hurt Mick in this moment, it would be so much easier to understand why it's so important that he be himself and use his powers responsibly. But as it is in the movie, it seems like the biggest consequence of him being a werewolf all the time is just that the popularity kind of starts to go to his head. And even then, he never seems that out of touch. He's still nice to his friends, he still makes time for Boof, he's hogging the basketball court a little bit, but that never seems all that serious. As far as its function in the plot, you could probably replace Scott turning into a werewolf with Scott, like, getting a makeover or getting a cool new pair of sneakers, and the story wouldn't really change that much. Which I feel like is a bit of a flaw overall. I don't think that should be true of a werewolf story. Not to mention, they further undercut this message right after the school dance when Scott's dad intimidates the principal all over again. The thing he told Scott about as a cautionary tale to warn him of the dangers of exploiting your werewolf powers, he just does the exact same thing again. They also undercut it by having Boof kind of get over her aversion to Scott's wolf form at the dance. She's eventually like, oh fine, and <laughs> makes out with his werewolf self. So, problem solved. The movie ends with Scott resolving to win the championship basketball game as himself, not in wolf form. Which is fine, I guess. It's fine. The movie's fine. <laughs> I did read some interesting commentary recently from Craig Ian Mann in his book Phases of the Moon, A Cultural History of the Werewolf Film, would recommend for all my fellow fans of werewolf academia. Mann argues that we can interpret both Teen Wolf films of the 1980s as satirical responses to the newly conservative gender norms that flourished under the Reagan administration. Hear me out. According to Mann, Scott's wolf form represents this caricature of the masculine ideal that was popular at the time. The Reagan era marked a return to social conservatism in the United States, and thus gave way to the popularization of these really over-the-top macho action stars like Stallone and Schwarzenegger. While Scott himself is not particularly conventionally macho, his wolf form excels in sports, gains the respect of his male peers, and attracts female attention in a way that his human form never did. However, as we've established, the point of the film is Scott realizing that this performance of masculinity is shallow and unfulfilling, even if the film struggles to emphatically demonstrate why. Mann even emphasizes the fact that the werewolf makeup used in the film is more visually reminiscent of apes or cavemen than it is wolves, which hammers home this point that the version of masculinity represented by Scott's wolf is archaic and regressive. Another example of the Reagan satire comes from the character of Styles, who, if you've never seen the 1980s movies, you might be surprised to learn is a rampant capitalist in this version. Hey, Scotto, tip of the iceberg, baby. We are cleaning up. Pretty much his only trait in the 1985 film is that he is kind of a sociopath who just wants to make money off of Scott's existence. Oh, and that he wears funny shirts. 
including this one. Styles' greed is also a pretty hilarious part of the film. Imagine if in MTV Teen Wolf, the first thing Styles did after finding out Scott was a werewolf was start selling t-shirts. But similarly to the hyper-masculinity of the wolf, Styles' unrelenting mercenary tendencies represent this distasteful element of American society in the 80s that the more morally sound characters like Boof reject right off the bat. Generally, I think this is a really fascinating read of the film. It kind of makes me like it better. But for the record, Mann also points out the inconsistencies of the film's message, especially with the film concluding with the characters winning the basketball game, or in Teen Wolf 2, with protagonist Todd winning the climactic boxing match. Spoilers. We'll talk about that movie in a second. Because even though they achieved this without werewolf powers, or allegorically not through this heightened performance of toxic masculinity, they're still operating within this system that rewards them for their conventionally masculine achievements. According to Mann, despite having learned not to measure their worth by their typical masculine attributes, both Scott and Todd do exactly that. And while I'm ragging on this movie, let's talk about some of the extremely outdated jokes. I do not mean, like, jokes with outdated pop culture references. I mean... Wait a minute, are you gonna tell me you're a fag? I mean, if you're gonna tell me you're a fag, I don't think I can handle it. Yeah, so this movie is a product of its time. Funnily enough, Night of the Comet, one of Atlantic's other big hits at the time that I mentioned earlier, also suffers a little bit from this. So that means that the last guy on Earth is either a gentleman or a fag. I mean, what are the odds? In LA? Don't get me wrong, I totally get that things were different in the 80s. I realize that many people probably didn't think twice about this kind of thing, but I also think there are plenty of 80s teen movies that don't include language like this, so I don't think that's an entirely convincing excuse. Just something to watch out for if you do choose to watch this movie. Politically, though, this is kind of interesting, because going back to the Reagan stuff, it does contribute to this sense in the movie that aggressive masculinity and aggressive heterosexuality are socially the most important things to a young man. At this time, in this place, it would be more socially acceptable to be a werewolf than to be gay. And, interestingly, it's not the only time in the movie that they subtly compare being a werewolf to homosexuality. Don't tell us what's it like coming out of the closet! <laughs> I just want to keep that in mind. Considering the homoeroticism of MTV Teen Wolf, I'm interested in that theme in general in this franchise. But it's not just the gay jokes. I briefly mentioned earlier a character by the name of Chubby. This character's thing is that he's fat, and that's hilarious. He eats all the time because he's fat, and that's funny. I'm just not into this kind of humor. It comes off really mean-spirited, and there's never really an actual joke there. I'm glad that this type of joke is not very popular in the mainstream anymore. Hashtag justice for chubby. Before moving on to Teen Wolf 2, let's talk about some miscellaneous stuff. So, you know how in my first Teen Wolf video I made fun of all of the blatant product placement on the MTV show? Well, it turns out that this is actually a long-running tradition in the Teen Wolf franchise. Early on, Coach Finstock is unabashedly enjoying some delicious KFC. Great game out there today. You want a thigh or a wing or something? This film also includes a school play as a minor plot element. The popular girl, Pamela, is starring in the school play. This whole thing kind of made me wish that MTV Teen Wolf had included a school play subplot at any point, because I always think that's a really fun thing to do in young adult media, although I haven't technically finished the show yet, so I'm still holding out hope for the school play season. But the more notable thing about this is that from the small glimpses we get, the play itself appears to be some sort of parody of Gone with the Wind-style Confederate South melodramas. You can murder my family! You can ravage my body! But I beg you, with all that is decent and holy, don't destroy my plantation! I just couldn't not mention that this is in the movie. I also want to acknowledge the soundtrack in this film. From what I can tell, it wasn't uncommon for Atlantic releasing films to have a soundtrack of fully original pop and rock songs. They do it in Night of the Comet too. It's so 80s and wonderful. Now that you got everything that you wanted, you're gonna have to learn to deal with the dream. I don't 
don't know if they did this because it somehow worked out to be cheaper than getting the rights to existing songs, but I think it's pretty awesome. Teen Wolf has this great song, Win in the End, that plays during the final basketball game. There's also a song called Big Bad Wolf by the Wolf Sisters, which plays at prom while all the kids do a wolf-themed dance. God, MTV Teen Wolf could never. But they actually do also make use of one prominent existing popular song, and that is Surfin' USA by the Beach Boys. Surfin' USA Styles and Scott do this thing sometimes where they surf on top of each other's moving cars. I can't believe that they didn't incorporate this into the MTV series. But you know, maybe they didn't want to set this dangerous of an example for the children watching at home. Speaking of the cars in the film, we have three prominent Scott and Styles cars, which I thought was interesting since the MTV series also had a prominent car. Scott drives his dad's hardware store van, Styles drives this really beaten up patchwork car, and eventually trades it in for this, the Wolfmobile. Again, huge missed opportunity on MTV Teen Wolf's part. They could have at least called the Jeep the Wolfmobile. Aw, what, are you too cool for school, MTV Teen Wolf? Would the Wolfmobile be too stupid? We wouldn't want to cheapen the brand of our teenage werewolf lizard man druid Kitsune show. Let's ride this Wolfmobile right on into 1987 to dissect Teen Wolf 2 Electric Boogaloo. It's not called that. It's just called Teen Wolf 2. But before we fire up the Wolfmobile, I want to tell you about today's sponsor. Squarespace is a website building platform, and whether you're a teenage werewolf basketball player or just a podcaster or something, Squarespace has the right tools for you. I always mention their website builder because I think that's one of the biggest perks of using Squarespace, that they have all of these really nice, unique looking templates so that you have somewhere to start, even if, like me, you don't know the first thing about graphic design. I know I might have had you fooled with all these beautiful thumbnails. But another thing I think is really cool about Squarespace is that you can kind of have everything you need in one place. Like if you're a content creator, you can host your content, sell merch or services, and offer subscriptions all from your Squarespace site. You wouldn't have to find any third parties for that stuff. Plus, all the files that you upload to your website stay right in this handy asset library, so you can always access them again. I recently posted a blog entry on academic werewolf resources, and I wanted to use a lot of pictures, so that proved pretty helpful. And of course, you can buy custom domains through Squarespace. Let's see if wolfteen.com is available. What do you know? Right now you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and if that sets your wolf senses afire, you can go to squarespace.com slash Mulcahy for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash Mulcahy. Someone in my last video's comment section told me that I was pronouncing my own last name wrong, so... Make of that what you will. And thanks Squarespace for continuing to support my vital contributions to the field of werewolf media studies. Hi, it's me again. I'm from the future, but also the past for you. It's weird. This is not an ad, that already happened, but I'm almost done editing this video and I just wanted to take this break in the video to also acknowledge the ongoing labor disputes happening in the film industry right now. Of course, the Writers Guild of America has been on strike since May, but as I was starting to edit this video, SAG-AFTRA also went on strike. This is the first time since 1960 that two different Hollywood unions are on strike at the same time, and obviously it's probably going to have a huge effect on the industry and the media landscape in general in the next few months. I'm bringing this up because A, I support both of these unions and I think that we should all be aware of what's going on and how to support people on the picket line, and B, there's been some talk lately about what influencers who make film and TV related content should do during the strikes, like whether there's anything we should or shouldn't be doing in relation to this. 
And there are some things that are still a little fuzzy, but in general, SAG is advising that content creators avoid promoting struck work, meaning work from any studios in the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, which is most of the big ones. And this includes organic posting and unpaid promotion, so even if the studio didn't reach out to you offering to pay you, it could still count as promotion. Now, again, it's kind of hard to be sure on some of this stuff because, for example, critics are still allowed to review review movies and TV, but I wouldn't necessarily call my videos straightforward reviews, I certainly wouldn't call my job title critic, and even though I don't make videos with the intention of promoting whatever I'm talking about, it seems like a really slippery slope. Like in a lot of cases, any publicity is good publicity. Talking about a certain property at all is inevitably going to bring more eyes to that thing. So just to err on the side of absolute caution and try to be as supportive of this action as I can, I am going to try to not make videos about struck work for the duration of the strikes. Obviously, I am releasing this video. It's because it was already largely done when SAG went on strike, and I'm contractually obligated to get a video out this month and I didn't have time to make something else. But I am considering postponing the third Teen Wolf video. Um, I know that would be a bummer, but I really want to be safe here. I am not trying to overstate my personal importance to this issue. Obviously, I individually am just a drop in the bucket, but I think solidarity is the right thing to do. And honestly, it's also very possible that I might want to join the WGA one day, and I really don't want to do anything that could constitute crossing the picket line and mean that I don't get that chance in the future. I find these strikes really inspiring. I think things have reached a breaking point, and if these unions are successful in getting their demands met, it will mean a much brighter future for anyone who wants to be a part of the industry someday. If you want to support the writers and actors on strike, from what I understand, the most direct way to help is by donating to the Entertainment Community Fund, which provides financial assistance and also counseling and other services for people in the entertainment industry. I'll put the link in the description. But if you're not able to donate or you want to do even more than that, it seems like just spreading awareness and showing your support is the best you can do. Maybe post about it on social media, or if anyone you know doesn't know about the strikes or doesn't think they're a good thing, you can educate them. Because here's the thing. I I love movies. I'm like if Tom Cruise was normal. Movies, popcorn. And the people who make movies are writers and actors and directors, not studio executives. So there's no reason studio executives should be getting rich off of their studios, movies, and TV while the writers and actors have to pick up three other jobs to get by. You know what studio executives do? They cancel our Degrassi reboot because they want to fill their library with 50 more seasons of MILF Manor. In terms of my stuff, I actually think this could be kind of a fun opportunity to talk about some stuff I wouldn't normally. We could get back into Bollywood, we could talk about more books, or find some really weird, small, independent movies. I found out Lifetime is half-owned by Disney, which is an AMPTP, so no wrong video for the time being. I just wanted to make sure I added something about the strikes to this video so that you know I'm thinking about them and that this will probably be the last time I talk about something from a major studio for a while. Lots of love to WGA and SAG-AFTRA and David Zosloff. Meet me in the pit. You still owe me $22 million. Teen Wolf 2 stars Jason Bateman in his film debut. If you're wondering how he landed this role, um, his dad produced the movie. So, Bateman stars as Todd Howard, cousin of Scott Howard, who is nowhere to be seen in this sequel. Todd apparently has a very close relationship with his uncle, Scott's dad, one of the only returning actors from the first film. We do still have the characters of Styles, Coach Finstock, and Chubbs, but all except Chubbs have been recast. In Teen Wolf 2, Todd is a nerdy science lover beginning his freshman year at Hamilton College, where he has received a mysterious scholarship. 
What about that sports scholarship they gave you? I mean, the closest you ever came to an athletic field was playing clarinet in the marching band. It turns out that Coach Finstock convinced the dean, played by John Aston, to give Todd a boxing scholarship in the hopes that Todd will eventually become a werewolf like Scott, which would make him great at sports. I gave that kid a full scholarship based on your recommendation! Also, Styles and Chubbs have for some reason followed Todd to college, despite not knowing him. I guess also in the hopes that Todd will turn out to be a werewolf. That boy's got werewolf written all over him. It's like, why wouldn't they have followed Scott to college? Maybe they had a falling out with Scott when it became clear that all they were interested in doing was exploiting him financially. Anyway, this seems like it's going to be a disaster because Todd is a dweeb who sucks at boxing and just wants to study crustacean reproduction. My research is in crustacean reproduction. How exciting. But his werewolf powers do indeed eventually manifest. <laughs> oh my! You're a dog. Teen Wolf 2 is pretty bad. It honestly makes you appreciate Teen Wolf 1 a lot more. Something I didn't mention when talking about the first one is that besides all the specific issues I pointed out, the original film just comes off a little generic and bland overall. When you think of the great teen films of the 1980s, I feel like the best ones have so many unique and original elements and characters, and to be honest, I think Teen Wolf is lacking that a little bit. For a teen werewolf film, it's not actually that memorable. But that is nothing compared to the blahness of Teen Wolf 2. It's kind of like if every element from Teen Wolf 1 was way more boring. Part of it is Jason Bateman, I'm afraid. And I like Jason Bateman. He plays a great comedy straight man most of the time. I think he was just super miscast here. He, like, leeches charisma from every scene he's in. He actively drains the frame of likability. You can start by saying you're really sorry for mistreating someone you like. I'm sorry for mistreating someone I really love. One of the biggest problems with the movie is this. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think Teen Wolf 2 takes itself a little too seriously. It's definitely still aiming for comedy, but there are many elements in which it chooses to be less irreverent than the original. The romance is one example. Todd has an equally mousy love interest, they bond over their shared love of microscopes and stuff, and these are the scenes where the film really grinds to a halt for me. If you think I'm gonna feel sorry for you, you can forget it. But I'm a dog. You'll be okay. I mean, it's not like the Scott and Boof relationship was particularly compelling, but at least they weren't playing it as dead straight as they are in this film. My feelings for you are real. They have nothing to do with the wolf. Those others could care less about the real you. Look, I'm late and you're wrong. Speaking of romance, another shout out to KFC. Thanks for financing our movie. But that's not the only place where the film takes itself too seriously. On the one hand, this movie does do a better job demonstrating how the wolf makes Todd a worse person. He actually does seem to get more aggressive and cruel as the wolf. There's this scene where he's speeding in his car and like actively trying to run people down. He stops caring about his studies, starts mistreating his friends and girlfriend. But when his loved ones inevitably start to turn on him for this, it's just way too serious. I wanted you to become the wolf more than anybody else. So I guess I'm partly to blame for what you've become. Styles, of all people, is like, man, Todd, you've really changed. Styles, you were the one selling Teen Wolf baseball caps 15 minutes ago. Really, the whole third act is barely comedic at all. It's pretty much played like straight drama, which is bizarre. The first movie was very irreverent to the point of being a little mean-spirited in its humor at times. Like I said earlier, Styles is essentially a sociopath in the first movie, and I think that type of humor works a lot better for something like this. The movie is not dramatic enough to make us really invested in the characters, but not comedic enough to be funny. So, not really good on either front. Another thing that drags Teen Wolf 2 down are the boxing sequences. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with their execution, except for the fact that they go on forever. The first boxing scene lasts approximately eight minutes, which might not sound like a lot, 
but is a lot when you consider that the only point of this scene is for a boxing match to take place in which Todd turns into a werewolf and wins the match. For comparison, the equivalent basketball scene in the first Teen Wolf accomplishes this premise in about half the time. But that's not even the worst one. The final climactic boxing scene takes up, no joke, the final 16 minutes of the movie. It just goes on and on and on. And these aren't like tight, riveting, well-structured sequences. They're incredibly boring and repetitive. And of course, the ending of this film works even worse than the ending of the first. Because at the very least, in Teen Wolf 1, even though having the success of the characters hinge on the basketball game undercuts the film's central purpose, at least at the beginning of the film, Scott seems to want to be good at basketball, and that is still true at the end. In Teen Wolf 2, Todd never wanted to be a boxer. He was completely uninterested in the sport and was forced into it. So why does this story end with him triumphantly winning a boxing match as himself? That was never a goal that mattered to him before the last 20 minutes of the movie. It would have made a lot more sense for him to abandon this game altogether and therefore be true to himself. I should also mention that to prepare to box in this match without his powers, he calls up Scott's dad, and Mr. Howard is just like, oh yeah, I can show you some moves. Really? Yeah, really. Maybe I can show you a couple of moves nobody's seen in the last 30 years. And apparently that was enough to make Todd a champion boxer. Miscellaneous stuff. This iteration of Styles spends much of the film styled exactly like Joey Jeremiah from Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High. There's this character, Todd's science teacher, and as soon as she was introduced, I was kind of confused as to why the film was treating her like an important character. She gets this slightly dramatic introduction, it's like a reveal. I think the answer is that she was just one of the more famous actors in the film. This is Kim Darby, who most famously starred in the original True Grit. But then at the end of the movie, it's revealed that she herself is also a werewolf, which sort of explains why she's taken Todd under her wing. Is this your idea of a threat? No. This is. But it's also revealed that she has a giant werewolf tail, which, as someone has helpfully pointed out in the IMDb goofs for this movie, doesn't actually make any sense since none of the other werewolves in this franchise have tails. Maybe it's a girl thing. Maybe only lady werewolves have tails. Anyway, I want to point out something about both Teen Wolf films, which is that both of them contain sequences revolving around 1960s nostalgia. In Teen Wolf 1, as we've already discussed, they have these two surfing USA sequences. And in Teen Wolf 2, there's this whole extensive musical number in which Todd, newly transformed into the wolf, performs the song Do You Love Me by The Contours. Do you love It's not Jason Bateman singing. The version in the movie was apparently performed by a band called Ragtime, but for the life of me I couldn't find any information about them, because the thing about googling the phrase Ragtime Band is that you will only see results about the 1911 Irving Berlin song Alexander's Ragtime Band. But I'm just kind of interested in the fact that both movies have these little moments of 1960s pastiche. It makes me wonder if, similarly to how we have a lot of 1980s nostalgia in media today, maybe there was a lot of 60s nostalgia in 1980s media. Just an interesting look into what was trendy at the time. But on a less positive note, speaking of the music, this film does not have an original soundtrack like the first one, which I found really disappointing. It makes it feel like they didn't care quite as much about this one. So what do they have instead of original songs? Well, not one, but two songs by Oingo Boingo. And a couple others. My favorite was probably this one, Send Me an Angel. It was very dramatic and very 80s. Open fire on my burning heart. Is there anything to like about this movie? Um, believe it or not, Coach Finstock continues to be funny. Even recast, he had some of the more genuinely funny moments in the film. 
There's this scene where he's flossing during a boxing match. I thought that was pretty good. And in one scene, he's reading a Boy's Life magazine. John Astin is good, probably because he's one of the only legitimate actors in this thing. And there's also this weird scene in a science class where Todd and his love interest accidentally start a fight with dead frogs for dissection. And it's not great or anything, but this was such a weird thing, I found it kind of humorous. <laughs> Overall, though, Teen Wolf 2 is in almost every way just a worse version of the first film. And the first film isn't even that amazing, so this one makes for a pretty lousy watch. I feel like the only reasons to watch it are if you're a Teen Wolf completionist like myself, or if you're the number one Jason Bateman fan in the world, to the point where you want to subject yourself to even the strangest pockets of his body of work. And that's it! That's all the pre-MTV Teen Wolf media there is. Kind of anticlimactic, but that's life. We're done. I guess it's time to end the video. Do you guys... Do you guys hear that? Oh no. Not again. It's a hairy anyone sees me like this. That's right, not only are there two live-action Teen Wolf films forming the foundation of this franchise, there is also a short-lived animated series. Yeah, remember how I said there would be a surprise in this video? Surprise! I also said earlier that there were probably some fans of the MTV Teen Wolf show who didn't even know that it was based on a film franchise due to the sort of faded popularity of said movies. And I wasn't totally sure about that claim, like I'm guessing I'll get several people in the comments pointing out that they always have been aware of the films or that the films are more popular than I'm giving them credit for. However, I feel that I can say with complete certainty that virtually no modern MTV TV Teen Wolf fans are aware of the existence of the animated series, and even if they are, I highly doubt that they've watched it. I'm sure there are exceptions, there's always that one person. Honestly, if you have seen all of the media in this franchise, please leave a comment, because I would find that pretty impressive. But in general, it seems to me that this show has all but faded into total obscurity. On IMDb, this series has a 5.8 out of 10, based on only 364 ratings. Not the worst numbers I've ever seen, but still pretty bad numbers. For comparison, the 1985 Teen Wolf film has 57,000 ratings, Teen Wolf 2 has 12,000 ratings, and the MTV show has 157,000 ratings. So only 364 people taking the time to leave a rating on IMDb is pretty minuscule for a Teen Wolf joint. Needless to say, I feel that I have a bit of a special opportunity on my hands to dissect a piece of media that probably not many people have yet bothered to dissect. You might be wondering, how did this happen? Why a Teen Wolf cartoon? Who made this? And most importantly, why does it look like that? We'll be answering all of those questions and more in my final and most esoteric review of the day. I tried so hard to get the shirt in frame, and it's still, like, not at all in frame. So, um, take this moment to feast your eyes on my vintage-style Teen Wolf shirt. First and foremost, I have to give a big shout-out to the YouTube channel Schnast TV. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced. It's either Schnast TV or S-H-N-A-S-T TV. Either way, this channel has uploaded and, according to them, personally remastered every single episode of this cartoon, which was obviously really, really helpful for the creation of this video. I just described how obscure this show is, and in keeping with that, it's pretty hard to track down legally. Supposedly, it got a DVD release at some point, but only in Region 4, meaning that the one or two copies online go for like 40 to $50. It is free to watch on Pluto TV, but the quality is a good deal lower than this person's remastered version, so I'm really grateful for their service. It looks like they upload a lot of rare old cartoons, including some of their other remasters, so you should definitely check them out if you're into that kind of thing. So... 
Who, what, where, why, and how is the Teen Wolf animated series? The show began as a co-production between the Australian division of Hanna-Barbera and Clubhouse Pictures, which was the family programming division of Atlantic Releasing Corp. The show actually aired in between the two theatrical films from September 1986 to November 1987. It lasted two seasons for a total of 21 episodes. Only one actor from either of the movies reprised their role for the cartoon, and that was James Hampton, who returned as Scott's dad, Harold Howard. The rest of the cast was mostly made up of veteran voice actors of the period. The show's relationship to the movie canon is interesting. It's in many ways pretty accurate to the movie, but in some notable ways not so much. For starters, it's definitely aimed at a different demographic than the movies. The movies are clearly teen and up with some pretty raunchy humor, whereas the show is very much for children. The humor and premises are much more tame and simple, and at times fabulistic. There's often a moral of sorts at the end of an episode. But the details of the premise are also pretty different. Notably, this series was the first work in the Teen Wolf franchise to have Scott's werewolfism be a secret. Only my friends Booth and Styles know my hairy secret. As we've established in the movies, the whole thing is that our werewolf characters use their werewolf forms to gain popularity. But in this show, similarly to the MTV show, Scott has to keep his condition a secret, which becomes one of the main sources of conflict. Some of the characters have changed here as well. The characters transferred directly from the films are Scott, Scott's dad, Styles, Booth, Pamela, Mick, and Chubbs, but we also have a few new characters. Unlike the first film, in which Scott lived alone with his dad, Scott now lives with his dad, his grandparents, and a little sister named Loopy, which is almost as subtle as the werewolf in Harry Potter being called Lupin. His grandparents' shtick is that they are, first of all, from Transylvania. Dinner is at six! We're having Transylvanian goulash! Scott is canonically Romanian. Yas representation, but his grandparents are also always in their werewolf forms, with a few rare exceptions. Boof also now has a dad who is the mayor, Mayor Marconi, but we don't see him that often, he's not that important. And notably missing from the animated series, I regret to inform you, is Coach Finstock. This is the only Teen Wolf property with no Finstock. It's pretty sad. Speaking of which, does Scott play a sport in this version? He doesn't play basketball like in the movie or lacrosse like on the show, but at the very end of season one, we learn that he's on the football team, so technically that's the sport of this version. In terms of characterization, most characters are pretty consistent with how they were in the films. Scott is still an all-American boy next door. Styles is still completely consumed by greed. It's pretty funny to see this dynamic translated into an episodic series, because we get to see Styles come up with a new get-rich-quick scheme in virtually every episode. These are real werewolves! Do you know how much money we can make by selling these pictures? You can't find a werewolf without an official torch. Only one buck each. Are you kidding? How much do you think people will pay to see a real industrial strength werewolf? Listen, good buddy. There might be a real future for you in the demolition business. I could make some calls. <laughs> you know how much money we could have charged? Styles! I'm producing the making of the Wicked Werewolf of Wolverton. I'll sell it to everybody. It's a gold mine. Shane of the She-Wolf co-hosting with Teen Wolf. I love it. I love it. We'll make a fortune. I will say, although Scott is pretty similar to how he's been depicted in the franchise prior to this, this version makes one change that is not present in any other installment, which is that whenever Scott turns into a werewolf, his voice kind of changes. Your clunker will never catch up with Mick's car. I'll die if anyone sees me like this! This isn't that important, but I just wanted to mention it because it leads to some pretty terrific line deliveries. Styles! That rat! I'll get him! Like I said, Boof is in this version, but I'm almost a little annoyed at her inclusion because she is in so little of it. It seems like the writers frequently forgot Boof was supposed to be around. She certainly never gets any romance with Scott. In fact, Pamela gets a lot more screen time. Pamela and Mick are around a lot. I kind of enjoy the 1980s camp of these two preppy characters. Mick's catchphrase is, but Pam... You must have a pretty low opinion of me if you expect me to believe that. But Pam... 
Also notable is the change in setting. While the movie was set in the fictional town of Beacon Town and the MTV show is set in the fictional town of Beacon Hills, the show is set in the fictional town of Wolverton, a town which is itself werewolf themed. Everything is wolf this or wolf that, if they only knew. I guess it's werewolf themed because it has a long history of werewolf sightings because of the Howard family. And when I say werewolf themed, I mean really werewolf themed. This town has werewolf themed movie marathons. The local burger joint is called Wolf Burger. There's a werewolf motel in one episode. The mayor's most important responsibility is planning the annual town werewolf festival. What's wrong? Oh, I just can't think of a really spectacular finale for this year's Werewolf Festival. I thought this was a great detail. This would have been a fun element to include in the MTV series. This show, like most Saturday morning cartoons, doesn't really have any overarching plots. It's just episodic. The characters don't really change over time. So instead of telling you the plot of every episode, I feel like I should just tell you about all the parts that I found the most funny or interesting. So right off the bat, by far the best things about this show are the opening and closing credits sequences. Beware, I know that this means I'm kind of setting up the rest of the show for failure, but I can't lie to you. The opening and closing themes are, first of all, hilarious songs. The opening theme is very 80s. Closing theme seems to be going for more of a 1960s kind of thing, once again contributing to this franchise's love of 60s nostalgia. He's got style, looks so wild. Demo, demo. But secondly, as I'm sure you can see, they clearly created some bespoke, higher quality animation for the credit sequences. I'm guessing it's rotoscoped, that's what it looks like to me, but there's something so retro and kitschy and cute about it, I feel like they could have sold shirts with this imagery on it to great success. See, I'm thinking like 1980s styles. How can we make a profit off of this? Speaking of the animation quality, I was trying to start off with compliments, but I feel the need to acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is that this show looks extremely bad. As I said, it was a Hanna-Barbera production, and if you're familiar with their work, I think you'll recognize the relative cheapness of this whole show. Due to the tight budgets they usually had to work with, Hanna-Barbera were known for their limited animation, reusing a lot of frames, not always having that much movement, simplistic backgrounds and character designs. Interestingly, Teen Wolf's production changed slightly between seasons one and two. I believe one of the studios changed, and hearing that, I was very curious whether I'd be able to notice a difference between the two seasons, so I was looking out for that. And I have to say, beginning in season two, the animation gets slightly, but visibly worse. Characters go off model more often, some characters don't always quite look like themselves, even the colors looked a little worse to me once I got to season two. Another really funny but also pretty annoying symptom of the cheap animation is that throughout the whole show, they mostly only have this one sequence of shots of Scott turning into a werewolf. It's even in the opening sequence. And when I tell you they reuse this series of shots literally every time Scott turns into a werewolf. Sometimes this means that we see this exact sequence in its entirety multiple times in one episode. I don't feel too hot. I feel kind of funny all of a sudden. Uh-oh, you better go hide quick! Worse yet, when it's time for Scott to transform back into a human, they just play the same sequence again in reverse. Imagine if in MTV Teen Wolf, every time Scott transformed, we saw the exact same footage played over and over again. Anyway, with the animation being so bad, you'd hope they'd make up for it with the writing. And sometimes that's true, a little bit. There are episodes that are pretty fun. 
In fact, one fun thing that happened while watching is I started to see the name Linda Wolverton show up as a writer, and I was immediately like, Linda Wolverton? Writing for a show about werewolves set in Wolverton? That's obviously somebody's pen name or something that is not a real person. But then I looked her up, and not only is she real, she's like one of the most beloved screenwriters for animation ever. She wrote Beauty and the Beast, the original one. She also co-wrote The Lion King, Maleficent, the book of the Aida musical, Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. She's a legend, and she got her start on the Teen Wolf cartoon. Never give up on your dreams. Anyway, it might just have been the bias of knowing that Wolverton would go on to be a celebrated writer, but I did notice several of her episodes in particular standing out. She wrote some of the better ones, in my opinion. One of these is the episode Wolf of My Dreams. In this episode, Scott is feeling really down about being a werewolf because it means that he can never really be a normal teenager. It's just that, well, it's hard being a teenage werewolf but he sees this woman on TV. She's kind of an Elvira type, hosting a weekly horror show. She's called Shayna the She-Wolf. I can't believe it! Another teenage werewolf! And Scott is immediately like, oh my god, this is a real werewolf who clearly knows what it's like. I can relate to her. So he and Styles go on this mission to find Shayna the She-Wolf in Hollywood so Scott can try to talk to her about being a werewolf. Shayna the She-Wolf co-hosting with Teen Wolf! I love it! I love it! This episode isn't that great, but I found this premise pretty amusing, and I was also struck by how earnest it turned out to be. Like, there isn't really a punchline to this episode. It actually culminates in Shayna giving Scott a heartwarming talk about how it's good to be different and he should be proud of who he is. I'm kind of different from the other kids. I know that feeling. He doesn't ever explicitly tell her he's a werewolf, and it's pretty clear that she is in fact not a werewolf, so she just assumes that he's like a social outcast or something. But again, it's just a very genuine message about being yourself. That's something I noticed about most of Linda Wolverton's episodes, is that they usually have some sort of moral or theme, which is not true of every episode in the series. I'm kind of different, too. But being different also makes you special. You know, I never thought of it like that. Another one of her episodes I really liked, possibly the best episode of the entire series, is the season one finale, Teen Wolf Punks Out. This is exactly what it sounds like. Teen Wolf, Scott, that's something about the 1980s Teen Wolf media, especially the cartoon. Sometimes people actually refer to Scott or Todd as Teen Wolf, like it's a nickname. Not bad, I guess, but I can't let anyone see me as Teen Wolf. Not only does our Teen Wolf throw a punch like lightning, but he sings too. In this episode, Scott wants to go out on the town with his friends to celebrate his big football win, but it's a full moon that night, and he ends up transforming while out in town. But luckily for him, the city is crawling with punks, friendly punks whom the kids met earlier. Who are they? What are they? They're punk rockers. I'm not sure what is up with some of these character designs, but I'm choosing not to dwell on it. Anyway, Scott and Boof soon discover that all of these punks just assume that Scott's werewolf features are a punk costume of some sort. Totally rad, man. Totally! Scott is elated that he can finally be himself out in public, and he starts calling himself Punk Wolf. I actually fit in here! And he gets really into it, like to the point where his friends will call him Scott, and he's like, no, I'm Punk Wolf. Scott! Scott! It's Punk Wolf, Boof. Punk Wolf! Eventually the kids go to a punk party, and one of their new punk friends is like, hey Punk Wolf, I'm about to do a rap. Come help me rap. Come on, I need a backup rap. And as the viewer, you're like, oh no. <laughs> But it wasn't as bad as I was expecting. This guy raps and Scott just kind of howls on the track. He adds some fun werewolf sampling. They call me Lizard. I am the rap wizard. I can even out rap the radio. But I don't want to do it all by myself. So, punk wolf, give me a little help. <laughs> oh! 
Like, how can you say that this isn't the best episode of Teen Wolf the cartoon? It's got 1980s punks, a punk version of Scott the Teen Wolf, werewolf rapping. The B-plot of this episode is that Pam and Mick are also out on the town, but every time they encounter some punk thing, they think it's icky and uncool, and they keep making fun of punk stuff and then getting their comeuppance. This episode ties into a larger theme in the Teen Wolf cartoon that I want to bring up, because it's kind of an interesting counterpoint to the symbolism of the Teen Wolf films. You'll remember that we discussed the film's satire of Reagan-era gender norms, the way the wolf in those films represents this unhealthy caricature of masculinity that is ultimately shallow and harmful. The Teen Wolf cartoon is similarly critical of the social conservatism and cultural homogeneity popular at the time, but the role of werewolfism in this critique is very different in the cartoon. Where the wolf once represented the extreme end of the conventional norm, this ultimate manifestation of rigid gender roles and traditional conservative values, here, werewolfism seems to represent the opposite of that, the marginalized. This show isn't hugely concerned with the symbolic potential of its subject matter, believe it or not, but if there's one theme to which they keep returning, it's this idea that Scott and his entire family face extreme otherization because they are werewolves. Scott often laments that he'll never be quite normal. He often wishes he had a normal family. Aren't there pictures in our family album of anybody who's not so hairy? Oh, if my family were only normal. It sure would be nice to have just one morning where I could get dressed and go off to school like a regular teenager. He also seems to recognize it as an important part of his identity and even gets angry when confronted with stereotyping of his people. Where does that guy get off making werewolves look like rabid dogs? And, of course, they're all forced to keep their werewolf identities secret. It's implied that they would be persecuted if anyone were to find out the truth. But if the town had known what he really was... Poor Uncle Itzak would have been tarred and feathered, not honored. Son, this is very dangerous. Do you know what they do to werewolves? Now, I wouldn't say that there's any super direct allegory here, no one real-life identity that we can compare this to, but I think that works. It's like this big general metaphor for anyone who doesn't quite fit into the cookie-cutter nuclear family ideal that was being pushed so hard at the time. There's this one really telling episode where the Howards are selected to be the all-American family, which I guess means they get paid by this rich guy to do brand deals and stuff. After a secret exhaustive nationwide search, the Howards have been chosen as the all-American family. I'm not sure what, if anything, this is supposed to be a takeoff on, but suddenly they have to completely assimilate into human American culture. And Scott is excited about this at first because he sees it as his chance to live a normal life, but he soon realizes that his family is incredibly unhappy now that they can't be themselves. Come on, cheer up! We finally get a chance to be an average, everyday family! They've achieved this goal of blending in with every other American family, but it's superficial and meaningless. Scott has to learn that being true to himself and his heritage is the most rewarding thing he can do, even if it doesn't always result in social acceptance or financial gain. I never thought I'd say this, but I think I like us better the other way. This is so fascinating to me. This is such a biting critique of American culture at the time period. And guess who wrote this episode? Linda Wolverton. I have to give Linda a lot of credit because it seems like she pretty much single-handedly gave this show this really interesting theme. It's only really present in her episodes. You blend right in with the crowd. I'm just like everybody else here. These are my kind of people. She also wrote the very last episode of the show, Howlin' Cousins, that also deals with this theme. Funnily enough, this episode is an attempted crossover with Teen Wolf 2, so we meet Scott's cousin, Todd, who is a total nerd loser. <laughs> And by the end of the episode, Todd, who didn't even know about the existence of werewolves, has transformed for the first time and accepted this fact about his family. But when he first transforms, he's pretty upset, and Scott has to convince him that being a werewolf can actually be pretty great, and that he should be proud. You can't run away from what you are, Todd! What 
What am I? A werewolf! We all are! The whole family! I will say, though, when Scott is trying to explain this to Todd, he's like, there are good things about being a werewolf. Like, being super strong. And then that's the only trait he lists? Good things? Sure! Werewolves are incredibly strong! Hey! I am strong! That's great! You know, maybe the werewolf stuff isn't so bad after all! I guess the only benefit to being a werewolf is that it makes you strong. But once again, we have this idea of werewolfism being superficially scary and socially unacceptable, but really an important part of one's identity to be proud of. Outside of the thematic stuff, another great episode not by Linda Wolverton is the second to last of the series, Scott and the Howlers, in which Scott starts a band. Yeah, remember in my first Teen Wolf video when I said I wish Scott would start a band? Well, the Teen Wolf cartoon delivered. You know we belong together, I will always stand by you, we're forever, whatever we do. You know this song is so great. I really wish I knew who worked on it, but it's completely uncredited as far as I can tell. Big Degrassi, everybody wants something vibes. Everybody wants something. My only complaint was that Styles was not in the band. They have this rando who we've never seen before on drums. Who are you? Why aren't you Styles? This episode also shows Pam and Mick trying to form a music duo and being terrible at it. These characters grew on me. They have real Barbie and Ken energy at times. Well, show me what you learned. That's what I learned! To plug it in! But sadly, as much as there are a few fun, interesting episodes, I would say there are many more bad, boring, bizarre episodes. There's this one where the town has their aforementioned annual werewolf festival, and the mayor needs some entertainment for it. So Styles is like, I bet I can get this famous team of daredevil motorcyclists. And he tries this, but they're all booked out, so this shady man on the street is like, Hey kid, you looking to get some motorcyclists? I can get you some. Uh, there was a bunch of them boys in the town I just left. They got folks real excited, uh, called themselves uh, the Wolf Pack, yeah, yeah. Styles, for some reason, says yes to this, and of course, when the bikers show up to the festival, they're like a vicious gang. They're not interested in performing, they just want their money, and when the mayor refuses to pay them because they're not doing what they said they would, they go on this rampage, destroying the festival. Scott tries to stop them, and they get mad at him and dunk him in a dunk tank over and over again. What's that episode of Degrassi where the girl is mad at the guy and does this to him? <laughs> anyway, the gang needs a place to sleep for the night, and Scott and Styles decide the way to get these guys out of town is to have them stay at Scott's house and make them think it's haunted because of all the werewolf shenanigans they'll inevitably see. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This episode is just so weird. Unlike the episodes I mentioned earlier, there's no theme or point to this episode. It just feels like someone was out of ideas. Which is weird, because this is only the ninth episode of the show overall. Other out of ideas episodes in my book would be the episode where Scott hits his head and gets amnesia. Oh, who am I? Huh? <gasps> Who am I? What am I? And of course, the episode where the whole family for some reason get left with the job of running a farm for a week. They all get really into it for no reason. They're not getting paid for this. I've been thinking about it more, and I'm determined to make this farm work. That's right! I want this farm to work too. Some not necessarily good, but definitely very funny episodes include Grandpa's in the Doghouse and Up a Family Tree. In the first one, a dog catcher without his glasses on literally mistakes Scott's grandpa for a dog, and grandpa has to spend multiple nights in the dog pound. At one point, the dog catcher also accidentally captures Scott. 
Ah, oh, this is humiliating! <laughs> In Up a Family Tree, Scott is having a werewolf family reunion, and I don't care that much about that part, but when it really gets good is the second half. Scott has this hot cousin from Romania who catches the eye of both Styles and Mick, and everyone's trying to show her around town. So Mick is like, why don't we all go on the town's Transylvanian mine ride? Have you ever been on a Transylvanian mine ride? Mm, as a matter of fact, Yes. I'm going to take you to Werewolf Land. We'll have a great time. There's like a theme park dark ride themed around an abandoned Transylvanian mine shaft in the town of Wolverton. I'm obsessed. And interestingly, Mick finds out that Scott's a werewolf in this episode, but of course no one believes him. She's a werewolf. She turned into one right in front of me, scared me to death. Sure she did, Mick. Here is where I want to share with you one of my biggest hot takes about this entire franchise. My hot take is that MTV Teen Wolf was more influenced by the Teen Wolf cartoon show than either theatrical film. Hear me out. This show shares a surprising amount of lore with the cartoon, in some cases more than it shares with the movies. For one thing, like I said, this was the first installment in the franchise to have Scott try to keep his werewolf powers secret, a really big change which is also true of the MTV show, but not of the movies. Furthermore, some of the peripheral characters like Pam and Mick seem like they're gradually getting closer to Lydia and Jackson territory. Yes, Pam is a redhead now, but I think that's probably a coincidence. I imagine Lydia wasn't a redhead in the pilot script. I'm sure they just happened to cast a red-haired actress in the role. But it is kind of a weird coincidence. Pam was not red-haired in the movie. That's a change they made just for the cartoon. And like I was just talking about, Mick is actually the first character besides Scott family and best friends to find out that he's a werewolf, very much like Jackson in season one. Where are you getting your juice? And on top of that, I think the relationship that Styles has to his car in MTV Teen Wolf could have totally come out of some seeds planted by Teen Wolf the cartoon. Obviously we have the wolf mobile in Teen Wolf 1, and before that Styles drives a beat up car, but there's not much showing that Styles is particularly protective of his car or anything like that. Whereas in the Teen Wolf cartoon, much is made of this. Styles drives what appears to be a beat up, repurposed hearse. Um, Eli Goldsworthy alert. I think you're dead. The writers of Degrassi season 10 ripped off the animated Teen Wolf series. You heard it here first. Anyway, Styles drives this crappy car. Very occasionally, they call it the Howlmobile. The Howlmobile. What's wrong with the Howlmobile? And over the course of the show, he starts to act pretty attached to it. And by Teen Wolf punks out, he's fully calling it his baby. He refuses to leave its side when it breaks down. Man, this car is seriously ill. It can't be. She's the only girl I ever loved. I can't leave my baby when she's sick. Come on, Styles. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just saying, that is some MTV Teen Wolf Styles behavior. It's all connected. Maybe we should just walk. Hey, I will never abandon this Jeep. You understand me? Ever. And finally, my piece de resistance, my golden nugget of probably yet untapped Teen Wolf lore, also Styles related, I am pretty sure that Styles was first given the last name Stalinsky in the Teen Wolf animated series. This is it! Stalinsky and Howard go Hollywood! He doesn't have a last name in the 1985 movie or in Teen Wolf 2, but you know what happens in season one, episode seven of the cartoon? Let's talk about the contract first. I'm her agent, Styles Stalinsky. Styles Stalinsky, baby. Like, prior to this, even with all my little details that I thought could have been inspired by the animated series, deep down, I didn't truly believe that the showrunners of MTV Teen Wolf would have watched the animated series. I thought it was probably all just coincidence. But with this, it's like, where else would they have gotten that name from? It's not in any other Teen Wolf media. You named your kid... Styles Stalinsky? MTV Teen Wolf would not exist in the form it does now had it not been for the Teen Wolf animated series. Change my mind. So, 
should you watch this show? A few episodes might be worth it just for the novelty of it all, but in general, no, probably not. The vast majority of it is just so boring. With the exception of a couple more passionate feeling episodes, most of it just comes off like a studio throwing the smallest amount of money possible at an existing property to try to make a quick buck. And given that it only lasted 21 episodes, I'm not sure they even succeeded in doing that. I think I would rather watch this than Teen Wolf 2, but I would rather watch Teen Wolf 1 than this, and I would rather watch Night of the Comet than Teen Wolf 1. I hope this has given you some Teen Wolf trivia you might not have known about before. That's really why I wanted to do this, because it seemed like some of this stuff was just so obscure. All in all, seeing the goofy beginnings of this franchise really makes me wish the MTV show had incorporated more of this stuff. Maybe Derek could have had some wacky Transylvanian grandparents. And I will just always maintain that the modern show should have had more campy high school shenanigans. Give me more sports games, more school dances. That was a really refreshing thing about watching 1985 Teen Wolf. Unfortunately for me and you, I still have one more video to make for this series where I will watch the last three seasons of MTV Teen Wolf, after which I will finally be free. Subscribe and stay golden, wolf boys. That Styles guy is a real twit.